We're here today for another Clean Technical webinar. This webinar is focused on attracting and retaining residents with EV charging uh, for multifamily, multi dwelling unit um, complexes and communities. Uh, the experts with us today to talk about this are very well well versed in the topic. We have John Karembalis, uh, Ch Chief Revenue Officer at EV Connect, and Keith Gillen, President of Mern Properties. Uh, clean Technica, as hopefully everyone viewing knows, is a top clean tech media and analysis company. We publish about 15 articles a day about the clean tech industry with a heavy focus on electric vehicles these days. Uh, EV Connect, uh, John will tell you more about, and Mern Properties, Keith will tell you more about uh, right, right now. I'm John Cramblis. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm John Cramblis. I'm Chief Revenue Officer of EV Connect. Uh, EV Connect's been in the industry for about 11 years, uh, providing charging and charging management services to various verticals, including multifamily, which we're talking about today, as well as higher education, municipalities, and uh, increasingly fleet. Uh, I have a 27-year career in tech and infrastructure sales, uh, spending the last 15 of which in, in the software industry. And I look forward to uh, having this exchange today. Uh, Keith? Great. Uh, well, number one, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, happy to uh, share some some thoughts about the uh, the current industry. Uh, as is said before, my name is Keith Gillen. I'm with uh, Mern Properties. I'm the president of the company. I've been in the multifamily industry for a little over 22 years at this point. I actually had my 22 year anniversary uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I started on the front lines uh, in leasing and uh, worked my way up over the past 22 years. So I've certainly seen a lot, although I, I joined recently that you know no one was prepared for the last year so things continue to evolve and I will stop saying that I've seen it all, everything because I clearly I have not uh, so you know again thank you for having me uh, look forward to the discussion so I think all the reason right. that we're all oh I'm sorry go oh, ahead sorry just, thank you both I was just we're, we're now we're gonna jump into a presentation industry overview uh, the general lead and then we'll get into debunking some myths and Q&A. So you can ask questions at any time, uh, but we'll get to them after the presentation and some uh, some debunking myths um, section. Thank you very much, John, take it away. Thank you very much, Zach. So I, I think the reason all of you are here today is because you, you, you've start to intuit what I'm displaying here on the screen, that there's uh, an increasing adoption of electric vehicles and that, that will be, uh, increasingly driven by your residents as they pull up to your properties. Uh, right now, we're forecasting that 31 million vehicles will be on the road by 2030. And you probably saw during the Super Bowl, the announcement of GM that they're going all electric by 2035. It's, it's really a, uh, it's something that we're increasingly seeing within the market. And we're, we're constantly working with owners of multifamily properties to, to say, how do we get there and how do we serve this new cohort of residents that are coming? The problem is, is that we don't have enough charge points to, to actually uh, serve these customers. Right now we have 25,000 and I'll, I'll keep going to Super Bowl commercial analogies. Uh, for those of you who saw the Will Ferrell commercial, uh, evidently Norway's beating us, but you can add a lot of Western European countries to that as well. We've got a really big country and only 25,000 charging stations right now to serve these vehicles that are coming online. You all serve about 100 plus million residents that come to your properties and you can kind of see that this math really isn't lining up right now. You know, and John, just to, just to jump in, if you don't mind, just a little bit. Uh, yeah, the, the, the interesting thing, and I know we're, we're going to get to it in a little while, but you know, the, the last slide, you know, in 06, and the, the number of cars that are growing is really exceptional. And I think we've all seen that we will continue to see it, you know, but as it impacts the multifamily world, and you know, that that's my world, you know, it, the, the question is, you know, bringing these chargers to our residents, um, 
And as we used to talk about, you know, we, there was amenity wars. You know, how, how big is your clubhouse? How big is your amenity space? How big is the fitness center? You know, what's the California kitchen look like, et cetera? You know, the reality is the charging no longer is an amenity, it's a necessity. You know, and, and I think that's really where we're at at this point, and, and we need to start embracing it. And I think, you know, if I can speak freely, you know, the multifamily industry is, has historically been um, sometimes slow to adopt some technology, um, and that's certainly improved over the past couple of years. Um, but, but this is extremely important um, for our residents going forward, and that's what we're seeing in, in my markets. Now, that's excellent uh, feedback because we I've heard the same thing from the clients that we deal with. Uh, they're really looking at this almost as laundry, that necessity that you talked about, but increasingly in the search process, it might be something that is an in or an out. If they've adopted an EV, they're going to seek out on those various listing services, uh, the properties that are most ready for EV charging, because that's the way they're going to, to choose to fuel their cars in the future. Yeah, and John, just real quick, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, pr I promise I'll let you get Zach get to the next slide. But you know that that's an important thing that we need to talk about is that you know years ago when we all started listing our communities on ILSs, internet listing services, whether it be you know Zillow or Apartments.com, currently, you know residents and our customers filter what they're looking for out of a community. You know, the, the easy ones to talk about, yeah, they filter because they want a one bedroom that's less than $1,500 or they want a community that allows pets at a certain weight limit. The reality is, and what we've seen is that people are making decisions if there's properties that have car charging stations or not. And, and we'll, we'll talk about specific examples as we go on. But if there's a, a household and they have two cars, one of which is an electric car, well, they're not going to move in a, to a community that doesn't have charging capability. And I think that kind of moves into your next slide, you know, where are people charging? But the reality is over the past 12 months, what we have seen is, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky today to be in the office uh, by myself because I get more work done here. But, you know, in the office, I don't have to wear a mask because no one else is here. But my parking lot's empty. You know, there is no one here. So really, the, you know, when we've got residents that are coming into these communities, they're looking at us saying, hey, I've got an electric car. I only have to go to work, possibly, you know, the office, maybe one day a week, you know. So people are really looking for this convenience and the, you know, back to the word necessity, they need it in their communities and they need it at home. And so if we, and that's an excellent point. And this, this chart is really showing you what's available to those prospective residents right now. Um, the population of EV drivers right now largely charge at home. There are stats that say up to 90% of charging occurs in the home. But if they live in one of your properties, they don't have that option unless it's available to them. So they're really looking at the gray and the yellow sections of this pie chart uh, for either public charging access or to charge at work. And if I were looking for a property kind of dovetailing onto your comment, Keith, and uh, I drive an electric car or my wife drives an electric car and I said, you know what, honey, that'd be fine. Why don't you just go find a public charging station? I don't know if we'd be renting that apartment. So, um, in fact, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be yeah, renting that I'll, apartment. I'll just jump in just briefly for a moment because I've been living with electric cars in uh, apartment communities, apartment complexes for the past nearly three years. And previously, we had no real problem with the public charging because there's a lot of options around here. Actually, when COVID hit is when it became more challenging because uh, there was an opportunity to hang out at Starbucks or at Whole Foods or at wherever we were, the mall, all these places where there's public charging stations. So it became much more, it became an issue all of a sudden because of COVID. And I'll just also chime in real briefly. A couple of years ago, we had uh, a free you know, EV charging station to review and um, the apartment complex wouldn't take it. Now I've got my apartment managers here uh, at a different place. They've been asking me about it because they can see, I think we have maybe three or four Teslas now living in the community, uh, Tesla owners, myself included, a couple others. Uh, so I think they've seen exactly what you said. It's gone from an amenity to a necessity they see more and more people probably coming in asking, do you have EV charging? And now, John, we'll, we will not interrupt. You keep going with the presentation. No, we'll no, come no, back to is, our... <laughs> this is, <laughs> but I this is the conversation we want to have. So 
Uh, this slide just shows exactly what we've been talking about. It, it, we're creating p potentially a bunch of what we call in the industry garage orphans, people that, that want to charge at home but don't have the ability to, and if they're in a multifamily unit, how do we, how do we bridge that gap? So next slide, please. This is what's been holding us back in the industry is really these four myths. Um, the expense. Are people even going to want this? Are they coming? It's going to be too hard for me to manage. And then what's really the ROI of this? Uh, you know, Keith laid down the context of this might be a necessity bleeding over from that amenity class, but it, should, it still should roughly pencil. And, and we're going to talk through all of these in, in the next section. And John, be, 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 before you move on very, very quickly, you know, when we're talking about these and, you know, this, this will be certainly an interesting conversation uh, as, as we dig into it. But, you know, I kind of want to set the table for everybody. You know, and I'll talk about our history a little bit more later in the presentation. But, you know, the first charging station that we did, uh, we were developing a project ground up. So it was 2011 and we have a partner on the deal and, you know, he suggested that we put in a car charge charging station. And frankly, I, I missed an opportunity. I probably should have taken a picture of it and included it in the slide. The, the thing is monstrosity. It is huge, but it was 2011. We put the first state charging station in. I can't even, I don't even want to tell you how much it cost us, you know, in the development piece of it. Um, you know, but we felt that we were early adopters at that point. And frankly, you know, we got pushed into it a little bit in terms of our partner really wanted to do it. Um, but since it was installed in 2011 and subsequently, and we'll talk about this project a little bit more later, but the usage of the, the, the station there, as well as you know how we've expanded the service that is there at that particular community, it, it is really evolved, but it is, it's almost humorous to see you know, how you, the physical technology has changed over the past couple of years. And I can only imagine how much it's going to going to continue to evolve in the coming years as, you know, back to what you said originally in terms of, you know, the number of people with electric cars is going to skyrocket in the coming years. No, and and, and that's that's why I think we have to go through these four myths and, and kind of make this a more accessible uh, amenity slash necessity for, for the property owners that we're dealing with because they see that it's happening and they just want to know how to get from here to there. So, if we could talk through some of these with the expense, there's a lot of public money available right now. Uh, California and New York uh, have about a billion and a half dollars committed. Uh, and we also operate in over 70 different programs across the United States. Utilities are funding this at a, at a pretty extraordinary rate. For those of you who adopted solar solutions, I think it's a pretty big analog to, to the way that that industry came up. We also look at just these tailwinds that we're seeing, whether it's uh, GM on the supply side saying we're not going to make uh, ice uh, gasoline powered cars in 2035. We're also seeing jurisdictions come in. State of California has already said that they're going to ban the sale of those cars by 2035. And we're also seeing um, other AHJs, what we call AHJs, um, agencies having jurisdiction in new construction pipelines mandating that a certain percentage up to 20 percent have uh, spots that are uh, EV capable, EV charging capable. And then probably I'm sure you've uh, seen in, in the news from the federal government, uh, Biden's climate change plan uh, is going to have a centerpiece around it for the electrification of transportation and a, an odd, oddly quoted number of 500,000. Uh, when a politician gives you an actual number, people start counting that number. So we're going to see more and more and more facilitation of charging as we drive towards that campaign promise. Um, you know, John, but as we're kind of talking about this stuff and you, you said, hey, you know, there's money out there from a development standpoint when we're doing development, ground up development. And I think, you know, most individuals on the call recognize what a long process that can be. And I, I should emphasize long, depending on your jurisdiction, you know, some places you show up with a shovel and a check and you can you know, start a project relatively quickly. And I, I kid, but, it, you know, some places it's, it's relatively easy in a particular you know, areas and whether they be counties, jurisdictions, whatever it might be that we develop in, um, 
it's significantly longer, right? So when we're talking about, hey, there's dollars out there and this is great, you know, from the development side of things, that that's fine and, and, and that's that's great. But when we when we underwrite deals, we don't look at that and say, hey, you know, there's extra money sitting here. What we're doing is we're saying, hey, listen, it's got to work because we've got to have these stations in. We've we've got to get the infrastructure done. And at the end of the day, if we qualify and we receive incentives, fantastic. That, I mean. Don't, cash is king. You know that that is great news. But you know when we look at it, we're underwriting stuff and making sure that it it, it makes financial sense. Uh, you know without any of the incentive dollars. Although it, it's it's certainly a benefit to get them. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't hurt. So no. if if you look at the expanse, this is just that groundswell of of having governmental partnership in 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 this switch to an electrified uh, transportation future. So I think we 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 probably have beat this one to death, but we'll punctuate it with a couple more stats right now. And I don't think any of you would be here if you didn't believe this was something that was emerging. Um, but 20% of all Americans are looking at an electric vehicle for their next purchase. That's pretty a astonishing. And we really we really see that within about a 20 year horizon, we're going to see over half of the cars that are are pulling up to to your buildings. They're, they're going to be looking to fuel and they're going to be driving electric increasingly. But punctuating on Keith's point is this last stat that nearly 60% of residents when polled, and this is that twilight once again between that amenity and, and that necessity, they're willing to pay a premium to be able to have the convenience of charging at home. And, and that's what I think we're here today is that it's not about whether this is coming or whether this is coming or not. It's about when will you make this investment or when will you consider this as part of your competitive landscape uh, for, for your properties and to attract and retain tenants? And hey, John, I, I agree with you 100 percent, you know, and, and I make the. You know the analogy a little bit to when lead certification started. You know, years ago, you know, when buildings were getting lead certified, um, you know, and there was a, a lot of commentary and a lot of questions about, hey, you know, is your demographic going to be paying a premium? Do they want to pay a premium? And when it orig originally started, yes, you know, that certainly happened, and people were paying a premium. What eventually it evolved into is that, you know, as a younger generation continue to, you know, become our renters. Frankly, it was expected. They expect you to be good stewards of the environment. They expect you as a developer to be doing certain things. So again, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but a counterpoint, in my opinion, is that this is going to be expected, right? It, it, it might not be today, you know, but although I think it is expected in certain communities, but the volume of charging stations will continue to increase. And I know we keep saying the same stuff and we're hammering the same point, but you, it, there's a lot of analogies out there and it is what is going to be expected going forward and you can't get left. You, you know, you can't get left um, and not planning for it. And, th and that's precisely what we do. Yeah. Well, Keith, I've got, yeah, I've got seven more slides that just make the same point. So uh, if you could just let me get to this. <laughs> Yeah, was, <laughs> Go ahead, Zach. I was just we we hosted co-hosted a, a EV charging conference in Abu Dhabi, the UAE, a few years ago, and we had a presenter from who owned a bunch of uh, manager of a bunch of hotels in the region, and he made the same point in the way as uh, com comparing it to wireless um, internet. That initially some people asked for it, and it's a nice amenity. Then it's something you can get, and it costs something. Then it's something that everyone expects. Is going to be free so so it's a similar kind of expectation with ev charging you know first it might be amenity then it might be something you know people are willing to pay for then everyone's going to say hey why don't you offer it for free this these guys do so it's going to be sort of perhaps the same transition but go ahead and and make uh make the point on the slides here so it, it provided this is in in your thinking now uh, uh, the next myth that comes up is this is going to be a, a distraction from my day to day operations. Who can do this? How can this happen? There is technology that is largely mandated by a lot of the subsidy programs that we talked about earlier. That's that's going to provide you that seamless control and the ability to to run this function within your properties. 
And that also includes uh, not only support for the property manager or, or uh, the person on site, but also for the drivers that are pulling up as well, because it's really a two-pronged approach to support. You know, and, and John, just a little bit on that, you know, from an operation standpoint, you know, we've got so many things that are happening from operations. And frankly, that's why I love the business because it, it changes on a day to day basis. You know, I can be you know, sitting behind an, a, a computer and, you know, banging away at Excel for eight hours a day. You know, the next day I can be out touring a property or like this morning I was, you know, completing a due diligence and it continues to evolve. But what I don't want to do is take on stuff that's not in my wheelhouse, right? So, you know, when we're looking for, again, we'll expand on this. You, I hate the word vendors, frankly. I, I look at it as partnerships. Um, you know, we, we look to grow those partnerships and those relationships. Uh, and it's got to be mutually beneficial. And, you know, this is one of the things that I really, really needed is that, hey, if you roll out a technology, and that technology has hiccups or it doesn't work as it's intended to, you know, that's a disappointment to my customer, right? And I don't want to be the middle person to, you know, a resident moves in, we've got a customer and they walk in and say, yeah, your charging station's not working and it's been down for X number of hours or days. I don't, I frankly don't want to deal with that because that's not my level of expertise. So, you know, making sure that we partnered with somebody that could handle that and will do it well uh, was incredibly important to us. No, I think, and, and your resident is your customer and our drivers are your residents. So I think by the transit of property, we share the same customer. The point is, is that we, we like to be partners to the clients that we serve to, to make this a seamless experience for for that driver slash resident that, that's living in one of your properties. So thank you for that clarification. And with that, I'm going to, uh, uh, without further ado, uh, introduce you to Keith. So Keith, if you, if you don't mind, a quick introduction to Mern. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, John. And frankly, I've, I've talked uh, significantly over the past you know, 20, 25 minutes. So apologies there. But uh, as, as I originally indicated, my name is Keith Gillen. I'm with uh, Burn Properties. I'm the president of the organization. Um, we have a couple of different organizations underneath the umbrella. Uh, one is our development company, and we started that in 2004. Uh, the development company has uh, developed roughly... I should know this off the top of my head, 14, uh, 14 properties in roughly 2,500 apartments. We currently have five additional projects in some stage of development, uh, totaling another 1,000 units or so. Uh, the other piece of our business is the management company. So the management company, uh, we've got, as of today, uh, 12 properties under management, uh, uh, totaling roughly 3,000 units. Uh, and I say as of today, because we're we're completing a due diligence as of this morning for a third party client. So that's going to be an additional 551 apartment homes. It's going to be joining the portfolio. Uh, and then we take over another one next Wednesday. So I'm going to have to continue to update my stats on a daily basis. But 50% um, of our account is for uh, for ourselves. So stuff that we develop. And then the other 50% is for third parties. And they, some of those might be, you know, smaller, you know, mom and pops that have one property and then uh, other individuals are uh, more institutionally minded. That's, uh, that's us in a nutshell. Ah, so, so, so the reason that John and I uh, met each other and started working together. So uh, we took over property uh, April 1. Uh, great timing. I mean, two weeks after the uh, the quote, hey, we're going to shut everything down for two weeks and we'll be back to normal. So, so much for that. But so we took over the property April, April 1, um, that particular property, and I'm based in uh, Columbia in Maryland, uh, but this particular property is in Montgomery County. In Montgomery County, there's a requirement in terms of a number of charging stations, et cetera. Um, this is 304 apartment homes, five stories of stick, slab on grade, so it's all surface parked. When we stepped in to this particular assignment, I think four of the five stations were not working, and it, it, it just... It was frustrating to say the very least. And we started our conversations with the existing company thinking, hey, that's kind of the best place to go. They know the technology, et cetera. Um, they came out, they tried to troubleshoot, et cetera. Fast forward 30 or 45 days, which is, you know, that's 
that's a problem in, in our industry to wait 30 or 45 days, frankly, in any industry. Um, but the response that we eventually got from him is that, yeah, these stations are, you know, four years old. They're, uh, they're, they're pretty much outdated at this point. We can no longer service them or support them. <laughs> Wait a sec. Well, you, I don't get it. You know, we're, we're, we're paying a, a fee, but we're not getting the support that we need. So really, it's a very long-winded way of saying that you know, that's where my, my real struggles started. You know, that's when we started to really explore uh, you know, who are we going to partner with? And again, you know, that uh, I use that term might have started as, hey, you know, what vendors are out there? Who can we talk to? But then it, it quickly morphs into, you know, who's going to be able to grow with us, right? Because we've got the management piece of it, which again, half of it is for our own account, the other half is for third parties. But from a development side, we've got a pretty robust uh, pipeline that we're looking at it and so say, hey, we need somebody that can grow and scale with this, number one. Number two, we need somebody that's got great customer service that gets our philosophy, which is putting the residents first and really focusing on them. And then three, which was very important to me, given I, I, I did my graduate work in technology, um, was that we needed something that was, for lack of a better term, and John can speak to this, but open architecture, right? I don't want to get handcuffed to a supplier, vendor, whatever it might be, that I'm locked into an extensive long term that as technologies start to morph and grow and as quickly as they do, that I'm stuck. And what started as providing, whether we called it amenity or necessity to my residents, now has become like an anchor in the sand because it's not it's not the latest and greatest and then people will start to judge us on that. So th there was a lot of factors that kind of went into this. Um, and that's really where, where John and I started our relationship. And that's, that, that's really, and it's fostered over the, you know, for, for a period now, and it's really kind of growing as, as we continue to grow. And frankly, John, I didn't tell you, you finished installation at one of our projects today and everything went well. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really evolving and, it, and it's, it's going very well. Yeah, just to jump in for a moment, someone just asked who who is yeah. we. So, so uh, Keith is talking about Mern Properties, uh, property management, multi-unit dwelling, public property management, um, and the. So, just to clarify, you had an unsatisfactory EV charging um, service provider or network, and you found EV Connect as a solution to to improve on that. Um, just uh, one question. Uh, so, did you? Did EV Connect then take over those those chargers and and make uh, make them operate better, or did you have to um, just put in new chargers and start working from there? And lastly, before you answer that, just you do realize April first is April Fool's Day, right? So you should probably shouldn't uh, <laughs> sign a contract on April Fool's Day in 2020. You know, yeah. Just, you know, hindsight, 2020 hindsight, you know. But. Exactly. I, cer I certainly appreciate that. You took me off my game because now I got to go back to the rest of the questions. But, you know, to, to, to answer it in short. So when we started vetting, and again, John, I don't want to monopolize too much time, but when we started vetting, you know, who were we going to partner with and moving forward, you know, part of my responsibility, you know, a fiduciary responsibility to a third party client, and frankly, for our own account, is making sure that we're looking at a number of different providers, um, both from a money perspective, but also from a you know a software solution or hardware solution. Um, so we went through a number of different uh, bids, proposals, etc. And that's when John and I, you know, when we ended up with EV Connect. And again, I I won't give specifics, and John can certainly add sure. if you'd like to. But you know, we replaced all the hardware. Because what we looked at it and was like, whoa, hold on, like this makes all the sense in the world. All of a sudden, we replace the hardware, we get new hardware, which is much, frankly, more attractive, aesthetically pleasing to look at, um, works significantly better, easier user interface. Oh, and by the way, my monthly recurring costs, and I shouldn't say this out loud to John, are went down. Right. So, you know, there's two different things when I'm looking at a capital investment. One clearly is the upfront capital cost, and depending on, you know, how you're accounting for stuff, whether you leave it in operations or you capitalize it. That's one thing. The second thing that we're all aware of is, you know, what's my recurring cost on a monthly basis? Because, you know, half of my job clearly is to 
to, to push the top line, the revenue, et cetera, resident satisfaction, which we'll talk about. The other half is really to control expenses and making sure that we make the right decision you know, that is not going to negatively impact the expenses in a prohibitive way, if you will. Yeah, and, I, and just to just to kind of tie these two themes together a little bit, to, to go back to Keith, what you were talking about, um, and then that prompted Zach's question, is this concept of stranded assets, right? It, 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 the industry has emerged to the point where open standards, uh, a protocol called OCPP, uh, is able to provide the customer choice between station management and even across different stations. So as new technology progresses, as costs come down, um, as you get a unit that's more very fitting for a specific application, with these open standards, and you can kind of think of it almost as the Apple versus Android analogy, although that's not exactly a perfect one, I think it gets the point across. It, the ability to manage across different stations is extremely important. So you don't, don't you don't get that dinosaur stranded asset that you were talking about. And, and I, I could probably guess, I, I think I already know who those were for you. But there's been a lot of companies that have come and gone within this industry. And by kind of hitching your wagon to open architecture and open standards, I, I think you can future proof uh, that total cost of ownership argument. The other, the other side of the coin is that operating expense line. Uh, there's different ways to structure even the adoption of it, whether it's uh, more of a lease or, or whether it's more of a capital outlay. But on a side of that question, it's more about uh, looking at the total cost of ownership over a five-year horizon or even up to a 10-year horizon, which is encompassing the management. We haven't even talked about the revenue side of this uh, because there are some questions coming up in chat right now about how rates get set and we can address that over time. But there are market rates established that your residents would be uh, pretty familiar with being EV drivers. And as long as we can advise and, and charge a fair market rate, we're, we're finding increasingly that we can cover the cost of not only the electricity, but also the operation. And, and sometimes even in cases of turning a profit, but a lot of the clients that we have are, are looking to engineer a different business goal. Whether it's I want to cover, I want to just break even, or I, I'm going to give it away for free because I think the marginal tenant will be attracted or retained. We can kind of work within not only the technology, but just with our industry knowledge to, to really engineer that business goals outcome. Well, and John, you bring up a good point, and it, you know, I promise Zach will move off the slide, but there, there's different ways to look at it. And we've had conversations, you know, what does this look like, right? Does it, in terms of, is it a break even endeavor for me? Do I look at, is it a cost of doing business in terms of the expense of the, the actual energy, you know, or am I looking to make a dollar, you know? And a lot of that is, it could be potentially client driven, whether it's for a third party account or if it's internal. And I can speak, you know, specifically to us internally, we look at it and say, listen, we're creating value at the property because we're retaining our residents, we're making them happier, which, and we'll go into this whole thing a little bit, but you know, it's not necessarily a money-making deal for us. Um, what we're doing is we're looking to just say, hey, it's got to be cost neutral. And if we achieve your know, neutrality there, that's fantastic. Um, you know, and really resident satisfaction is where we're picking the rest of it up, you know, and that that's important. So, you know, we, we look at it as, you know, really just a benefit for our residents and really a market differentiator. Ah, uh, the, the, the life cycle of a customer. <laughs> John, I'll talk about a little bit about this, and I, I will uh, promise not to be too long-winded, although that's becoming increasingly difficult for me. But, you know, we, we look at the, the life cycle of a, a resident, you know, somebody and a customer that comes in the door, you know, there's a number of different ways they come in the door, right? Whether they find us on an ILS, which we talked about a, a little bit earlier, whether it's a, you know, our property website, et cetera, you know, getting those individuals in the door is very important. Now, those individuals, and frankly, just getting the phone to ring, you know, is expensive. Um, making sure that we're marketing the right things and making sure that our residents know that we do have these particular need, that we have 
things that will address their needs, i.e. charging stations. You know, there's people come into a community with a list of must haves and then they're like, yeah, this would be nice. You know, in that list of must haves, as I indicated earlier, it could be, hey, it's got to have a fitness center. It's got to have electric charging stations. It's got to have in unit washer and dryer, etc." We look and we put in that bucket charging stations because we we believe that it's a, a differentiator. It's not going to be a differentiator, frankly, for that long, in my opinion. But while it is currently, I think we need to take advantage of it, you know, because I do think in certain jurisdictions, and we'll talk a little bit about it in terms of the requirement to put these uh, charging stations in, is becoming more and more prevalent, right? So, but at this point, some of the jurisdictions don't require, it, especially legacy ac assets. So, you know, getting people in the door is, is very important, clearly, right? Um, and people often say, hey, you know, people stay in communities because of the service they are provided, you know, the amenities, the uh, customer service, the maintenance team, you know, clearly. Um, so it's very important for us to retain our residents. I think national average, uh, 48, 49 percent in terms of retention. We, uh, when we do underwriting on deals, um, depending on the market, but most we assume that 50 percent of the residents we're going to retain. Um, Frankly, our numbers are significantly higher than that, and that's that's a different different conversation for a different day. But you know, we retain our residents. We're very proud to retain our residents, especially you know the communities that we hold. They're long term holds, you know, for our own account. We're 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 not in the business of developing and building a community and then selling it. We want to retain our residents. So as we retain those residents via the amenity package, customer service. Again, I'll say it because they're the unsung heroes, which are the maintenance guys. You know, people stay with higher resident satisfaction. And then inherently what that means is that they're going to be paying more at the renewal time, which is great. Um, you know, that's the goal. You know, we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, pushing that top line revenue, which happens one by new lease over lease transaction, but then also from a, a resident who's renewing a lease and able to push that a little bit more and you know we're not overly aggressive but you know again it's back to my fiduciary responsibility so it's yes we're we're creating an environment people want to live in and want to continue to live in we're you know delivering results to our clients whether they be partners or third-party clients but it's it's about making sure that the residents are happy they stay longer and frankly they pay more you know I'm increasing the the value of a property it's it's incredibly yeah, you're what keeps us you in bring business. it up on a different angle Keith where it's more like we were talking about the marginal tenant and attracting the marginal tenant but you're really talking about churn you know as if you're if if the units aren't there to charge the cars the pe the 58 percent of the people that are going to be driving electric in the next 20 years are going to be for you're going to force their hand they're, they're going to have to look elsewhere you're you're absolutely correct and John you know, to a, a story we developed a job delivered it, it brand new construction four story wrapped around a garage 250 units um, we put the infrastructure in for charging knowing that this was coming so we put the infrastructure in um, we installed and I looked at the property manager and said listen we'll we'll install them when we know that there's demand we we definitely marketed that they're, that they're there because I knew that as soon as we pulled the trigger they'll be installed within a week within the first two weeks of leasing we've already had to increase the number of charging stations right when we opened it in August we've had so much traction um, it, it, people wanted uh, people wanted that that charging and needed that charging, right? So we pulled the trigger quickly, okay? Like, hey, we got to roll, but it's part of making sure that the infrastructure is there because it gives us a competitive advantage again. There's a lot of questions coming into the chat, Seth. Yeah, I got distracted there. They're popping up here. <laughs> yeah, we can, I mean, we. I'm flexible. I think everyone, okay, we, we have Q&A now. So um, let's jump into the Q&A. Uh, John, Keith, if one is directed at one of you, I'll, I'll tell you. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, rely on you to, to determine who should answer a question. Uh, first question I can answer. It's just um, people. Some some people wanted to know what a uh, multi what MUD stands for. Multi unit dwellings. Uh, and the question here is, um, panelists, can you address uh, new building codes for MUDs and um, allow uh, allowing for tenants to install their own chargers at ready-made ports so can you just address the topic of yeah <laughs> building codes which is a messy messy topic and whether that allow 
you know, allowing people to just install their own chargers at a port if possible, like, you know, for example, a garage, like you can rent a garage for $100 a month or something. Okay. Um, well, all right. So I will, I know enough to be dangerous about code. That's why we employ consultants, et cetera. So I will, I will speak as intelligently as I possibly can on this particular subject. And please, you know, not knowing where the audience is from, please keep in mind, you know, our office is in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, we develop our ground up stuff is typically in Anne Arundel, uh, Howard, and kind of around the, the, the D.C. Baltimore area. So I, I can speak to those markets. Other jurisdictions, yeah, I, I, I really can't intelligently speak to them, um, but I will give you uh, one example. So Howard County, which is, again, where we're at, I've got three, four, four, four deals in our county, that, um, three of which we developed, uh, that, that we currently manage, um, some of which, like I said, we developed. We've got a pipeline of an additional three projects in this particular county that will break ground sometime in the next, depending on some of these consultants, anywhere from like 12 to 18 months. So we've got a pretty significant pipeline, very local here. Howard County last year passed a bill that starting in 2021, I believe that was the inception date, um, for every 25, 25 apartment homes, there has to be one charging station installed, right? Um, so they're, they're dictating, right? They're dictating from a county level saying, hey, if you're going to build in Howard County, yeah, there's not even an option. This is, hey, you've got to install a charging station and whether that's in a structure garage or if it's standalone garages, a podium building, whatever it is, you've got to have these charging stations. So we clearly are programming those in, but we're also programming the, the other thing, which is the infrastructure and the ability to expand as the demand goes up, right? So if we've got a structure garage and the, the, the apartments wrap that garage, you know, it's not terribly easy after everything is built to, to start chasing you know, power and you've got to make sure that your panel is sufficient enough to, to, to be able to manage additional chargers. So all of that happens now in the early stages. We put the infrastructure in place, you know, the, we're ready to go and we can meet the county requirement, but just like you know, building to green codes or uh, you know, LEED certification, there's a lot of jurisdictions that are pushing us and to just hit code requirements you're almost there on a, a, a certain thing. So you know, we don't do things to, to meet minimum requirements. We do things because we're long-term holds knowing that the, the, the demand is going to be there. So that's one way to answer the question. Two, um, in terms of existing jobs, so we've got some jobs that are a little bit older. Um, we're all aware you've got surface park you, and in surface park communities, you know, we've got some standalone garages, um, which is basically just a stick of, you know, five different garages that residents can can rent. And then you've got structured parking, which we already talked about, and also podium. Um, in our standalone garages, if a resident comes to us and says, hey, you know, I've got an electric car, I would like to, you know, install a charging station within that, you know, that stick of garages. That's fine. And frankly, we look at it as it, it increases the stickiness of that resident, it, it, as silly as that sounds. But if they take and, and we allow them, which we do, to install a charger in that standalone garage, number one, they're happier. Number two, it's already done. So it's like, why are they? They don't want to leave at that point. So we allow residents to do that. So hopefully, hopefully that answered your question. And um, an earlier question, John, just uh, can you give a short kind of elevator pitch on what EV Connect uh, provides, what, what you offer? I think it's really the service and support stack to run charging within, in this case, a multifamily unit uh, building. So if you look at the activity of managing a charging station and notwithstanding um, Keith's example from before, this is going to become something that's mission critical to your resident. They, they're going to need to charge. They're going to expect to charge. How does that happen within the, within the garage? But then if they are just plugging into a 110 outlet, which is actually possible, it's called level one charging, how do you know the electricity that they're drawing from the building to complete that activity? So when we look at the managed charging, this is really consolidating the asset view. So what is the performance and what is the utilization of the station? 
uh, but also it's going to give you that service stack as well to support those drivers. If they can't initiate a charge at 11 o'clock at night, where are they going to knock on or who are they going to call to get, get that done? So it's really the, the service and support stack to, to be able to manage charging in any location, but in particular in the multifamily uh, context. The second thing I wanted to talk about uh, dovetailing onto Keith's is when he started this, it was a, a refrigerator sized unit and there was usually one because of the expense. And I saw this question in the chat. A lot of buildings, especially on the new construction side, are looking at ratios. Some of these are coming from AHJs, so uh, uh, local jurisdictions saying, look, you need to have 10 or 20% of this parking, uh, EV charging accessible. And some of it's just coming from good old fashioned economics where a lot of these subsidy programs are providing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of free infrastructure uh, in what they call a make ready. So this is the ability to uh, almost provide a stub out to, to bolt on a charging station. That money is available now through a lot of these subsidy programs. It's not guaranteed to continue. So if you believe in the inevitability of an electrified transportation future, which probably a lot of people on this call have an interest in, in, in exploring, it's kind of like get it while the getting's good from, from a government program and even a tax incentive standpoint, while there's a lot of these governmental tailwinds, uh, because this valuable infrastructure is getting provided uh, by either utility, state, or federal programs at, at a reduced cost, but it's going to be part of really the infrastructure of your overall building, and it will be done at your specific expense once these programs uh, sunset. Uh, and there's a question here I can quickly answer. Are there opportunities to mark up rates to offset administrative costs? Uh, that is sort of a key point. If you get a smart charger or a good smart operator like EV Connect, then they can adjust the rates you know, as needed to um, to handle costs, increasing costs or whatnot. Um, question here. How can do I, I jump convince in on that really quick? Oh, yes. Back? Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, can I jump in on that one too? It's. I want to make sure that it's clear that you all would own this equipment and be able to, to run this equipment. We're a technology and service partner to support that effort, but the rates, we can advise and help with rates, but ultimately that is, that is your rate to choose and, and we can help you structure that once again to meet any business goal. Yeah, and do you wanna, I mean, do you wanna expand a little bit on how rates can, what rates can be based on, whether it's kilowatt hours or time or what? Sure, I mean, there's, uh, there's there's a multitude of ways to do it. Uh, we we tend to engineer it towards a goal. So a lot of our customers um, in different sectors are like, hey, you know what? We want to we want to serve a customer for two hours if it's like a mixed use retail, uh, and and we want to get the customer served while they're here, enjoying dinner or entertainment, and then we want them to move on after two hours. In a multifamily context, we're assuming there's an overnight, what we call a dwell time in the industry. They're gonna be there for eight hours while they're sleeping. So we have a lot more flexibility as to uh, when we initiate a charge, when we schedule a charge, um, when we could do it when the rates are most advantageous at the lowest possible cost. So there's a lot of different intelligence that's available to make that uh, activity as economic as possible. And talking about costs, in case people are not aware, you know the, the grid can, in, in certain places, certain regions, uh, utility providers can charge different rates at different times, uh, um, depending on electricity demand and supply. So often overnight, it has lower rates, uh, depending on the market. But, um, you know, so he's, John's, you know, pointing out that they could, you know, optimize the charging for the times when the electricity rates would be lowest for you. Um, so we jump to how do I convince other owners to invest in this upgrade? How much is the upgrade? And are you factoring in HOA rules on cost splitting equation? Uh, so I guess three different questions, same, same per person. Um, you've sort of already talked about why, you know, how to convince property managers um, to, to do it, but uh, you can talk more about that. And also um, that issue of HOA rules on cost splitting equations where, where that's yeah, right. I think it goes back to the point I made. Uh, this is about future proofing a building. And there's a, a great deal of money, there's a great deal of tax incentive available right now to make this choice. I, I don't know how long these will persist, but they are available to you right now. 
And if I were trying to convince an owner of, of a building, and I'm assuming this is coming from a management company or an agent uh, within that, uh, I would say, look, we're going to have to do this anyway in the next five years. There's a ton of vehicles coming. Our residents are going to be increasingly uh, doing it. We can tap into this infrastructure money now. We can future-proof our building, and we can add value to the actual facility. And if we wait, then we might lose some marginal tenants. Maybe that's not a, a gigantic deal, but at the end of the day, we're gonna uh, be faced with the inevitability of bringing our building up to this expected standard uh, that Keith's been talking about. And we're gonna have to bear that entire cost of making that costly upgrade. So that's, that's really the pitch. If I were doing it, it wouldn't be about making money off of retailing electricity. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is providing the pathway and the infrastructure to support the societal shift towards a, a more electrified transportation system. Um, the HOA rule question is a little bit dicey. We work with plenty of HOAs and I've worked with enough HOAs to know that there's not a ton of consistency between the rules of the HOAs. So the answer is yes. We do often work with our partners within the deal uh, to, to make sure that that we kind of dot all the I's and cross all the T's. But at the end of the day, there, there should be stewards uh, that would be uh, amenable to the same uh, talk track that I just gave you, which is how are we adding value to our property and how are we making this a more livable uh, space for all of our residents? So it, I, I think it should work itself out either on, on the economic standpoint or really from that extended service standpoint that we've been talking about. And I'll just real quickly answering that first question with some context. I mean, I don't think Keith gets anything out of telling competitors they should do this. So, you know, his 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 pitch on it over, you know, over several minutes uh, here, uh, you know, he's not selling any 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 competitors to do it. He's just saying this is common sense. And I I think it's uh, noble and, and uh, appreciative of you to you know focus on that, because I think it is important for society and for the world. But, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to tell. Um, your competitors, how you're getting a one up on them. So take that as someone not trying to sell you anything, um, uh, giving the story that you know that any of us could give. Uh, so jumping to the one, we have a, a slew of questions here. In California, is capturing low carbon fuel standard credits a source of revenue for the property owner? Interesting question. Sure, it, it, it can be. Um, most of those credits are, and the data that, that create those credits are, are captured within a managed system. So we have offered that as a service and, and part of the landed cost of deploying the station. And increasingly the value of those credits, especially in high utilization environments is going up. Uh, the building owner can claim those credits and we can help facilitate the structuring and monetization of those credits. Cool. So we'll jump. Um, as a Tesla owner, this is not me, this is a different Tesla owner. As a Tesla owner, I only need a plug, 110, 240. Isn't this the same for everyone? Why center on complicated and managed systems and multifamily? Uh, downsides seem to be too many systems, memberships, as if I needed a special credit card for every place I filled my, my um, gas car. I think on a one-for-one -one basis, he's right. I, I charge uh, on a, a NEMA outlet in my garage with a Tesla uh, travel plug. The, that's not the question. The question is at scale, how do you provide this as an expected amenity for your tenants? And this is really getting into a shared scenario where we would have one or two chargers and then you would rotate your car in on some sort of schedule or take advantage of future-proofing the building like we talked about provided as a more distributed amenity across all of your parking spots and then have that the ability to provide it to whatever tenant uh, or whatever resident is showing up to park in that dedicated spot. Uh, and then I am also a Tesla owner uh, to, to that question. Uh, the reason why I don't plug into a 110 outlet is because uh, it gives me about four miles of range per hour. So uh, Maybe in the pandemic that worked. I could charge my car over four days, but most of our most of our residents, most of our drivers, are looking for the quickest charge that they could possibly get for the most economic dollar. And Keith, maybe you want to say a little bit about answer that question a little bit as well, since you uh, are a provider. I, I don't know. I think John just answered it pr pr pretty well. You know, it's okay. number one marketing time, uh, also being able to distribute. Uh, the the solution throughout the community, whether that be a surface park job, you know, structure parking, whatever it might be. Cool. 
Uh, and next question, can you tell us the difference be between a proprietary station provider like Blink, ChargePoint, uh, and EV Connect? So uh, ChargePoint, Blink, they have a vertically or uh, integrated solution that's going to be a proprietary software mated with their proprietary hardware, and then of course support. The difference with EV Connect is, uh, and I think Keith hit this on, on his example of early adoption, we're working with a multitude of open architecture providers, which is uh, increasingly taking hold within the market to allow you the maximum amount of choice and flexibility when you're making this investment. At the end of the day, it's going to be about sizes. Uh, Keith brought up another thing that comes up surprisingly often, aesthetics. You're not locked into a single solution. You have the ability to choose from um, this increasing economies of scale scope and scale that are going to take hold within the market. And I'd rather hitch my wagon to a provider that can manage across different uh, form factors and manufacturers to allow me to dial in the right choice for, for my application. So sometimes I'm going to want something outside a class A building that's going to be aesthetic and beautiful. And sometimes I'm going to want something that's really compact and, and more economical. If, if you work with open architecture, you can kind of take the collective R&D and innovation of, of the rest of the world, whereas if you're within a proprietary solution, um, you're working with that hardware array and that's all you can do. Yeah, Keith, do you wanna add anything on that or? No, I, I smile and I kind of chuckle because, you know, aesthetics is what I do. You know, that's, uh, you know, that, that, yes, the, the, what makes a building really great in my opinion and this is sound a little funny but is the financing behind it like I, I love that piece of it and making making deals work and, and being financially successful that being said you can't deliver a, a you know four-story brick box and expect that it's going to lease the same way as, as other communities in a, in a sub market do um so i never minimize the the aesthetic appeal of certain things and not to over exaggerate but you know Every sign that goes in front of my building, whether it be a reserved parking sign, you know, we look at the, you know, the the post that it's on. You know, is that black powder coated? Is it, you know, is it silver? What is it? So there's no attention to detail that's too small, right? So I don't minimize the the aesthetics of it. You know, how is the cord pulled back into the charger itself? You know, do I have cords that are on the floor because someone didn't put it back up? You know, all of those things, as silly as they sound or as small as they might sound, are very, very important to us. Cool. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have a question. Older properties might not have power to meet NEC 625 requirements. What about level one? So a couple ways to uh, to address that. If you if you recall earlier in the presentation, we, we focused on two different programs, which are California and New York, uh, where they can look at that providing that make ready infrastructure. So that's not only the utility upgrade, but sometimes it's the premise upgrade as well to provide this additional service. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily rule out that you're you're kind of precluded by the electrical readiness of your building to be able to to adopt EV charging. But assuming it is difficult, there are both logical ways within our software to um, manage the available capacity across uh, multiple stations. So we have different ways that we can serve multiple customers, even though that there may not be a ton of panel room available. Um, level one charging, once again, is fine. It's going to be inherently an unmanaged activity. You're not going to be able to track anything that we're talking about uh, today. And you're also assuming all of those outlets are really near where, where your residents are going to park. So a lot of the customers that we've talked to are, are looking to do that more dedicated solution in combination with the utility uh, to bring new service and provide it kind of as an enterprise grade rollout uh, up front. Thanks. Um, so someone's asking for basically a follow-up on what you started talking about. Can you please walk us through the owner experience? Uh, for How do, does the owner sign up for a time slot to charge? How long does it take to charge? Do you have to move uh, the, the, the car when it's charged rather than leave it overnight, um, et cetera? And can you please compare it to the experience of an EV owner who has their own dedicated charger? Well, obviously having your own is, is is better uh, from a user experience, but I understand that in some cases we would have to adopt what we call a shared model. 
So once again, um, within a managed solution, uh, and, and Zach, you bring up an excellent point. The one thing that the software doesn't do is tow cars. And what we want to do is, is instill the right behaviors and then operationalize them through the technology. So some of those could be carrot and stick, like you get two to three hours at, at a reduced or even a free rate. But maybe that fourth, fifth, or sixth hour, if you're just going to selfishly park your car overnight in a shared spot, could be ex uh, a lot more expensive and indeed even punitive to, to encourage people to, to vacate the spot for the next tenant. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can bring to bear from our experience and then operationalize through our technology to make sure that we can effectively share that resource. The one imperfect part of that system is going to be the human being, but we, we could try to um, instill the right behavior and encourage the right behavior through the technology. Thanks. Uh, so that's a fun, fun one. Are there any studies that show tenant retention or for condos something showing that it affects the value of their properties? Uh, and as a follow up side note to that, they say a large and wealthy HOA in their community turned down a 50 percent grant to install a few chargers in their common area that was being requested by one of their members. So I think you know, the point is, how can you sell this with that point of uh, retention or Im improving property value? Well, I, I can't, uh, uh, the, the value to the property equation, I think Keith's probably a better uh, person to answer that. I mean, it, it's going to be in the, probably the six figure range. It's literally going to be the utility work that goes into making the building ready for EV charging. So once again, that's available today. In five years, it may not be available. So that's a, that is a calculable expense. On the front end of that question, it's a little, it's a little hard to monetize or I'm sorry to extrapolate this one variable of tenant behavior and say oh 14 percent more tenants uh, stayed because we put it EV charging I, I think that's more Keith's question to answer well hey John looks like you're uh you're, you're yeah you're st you're coming into my lane on this one but uh, you know you answer Come on, it, right? it seemed fair after all this I, I wanted to <laughs> <laughs> true, true. But it, it, you had a very accurate response. You know, it, it's very tough to look at it and say, yeah, there's a certain percentage uh, of individuals that are only you know, renewing their lease ag agreement because of it. Um, as I discussed earlier, there's a number of different things. Back in the day, old school, we used to say, hey, leasing consultants lease apartments, but maintenance teams are the ones that, that cause residents to renew their leases, right? You know, because the residents interfacing with the maintenance guy on a regular basis, that's who they see as, as the, you know, the representative. So again, it's tough to answer that question. I'm sure if we dug into it and we're all industry professionals on this call, but you know, I'm sure I could, you know, give Joseph over at Jay Turner a call and he's probably got some anecdotal information for me. Um, so I'm sure that they will continue to track and push uh, push that that survey question. Currently, I can tell you internally, we do not uh, you know survey for that specifically. But it's back to something John talked about earlier. You know, what I do have is I've got stats. Like I've got stats that, you know, clearly I didn't print them for this, I should have, but you know, how many people are using the chargers at different locations? When are they using the chargers? How long are they plugged in? You know, is it the same five people, et cetera? So, you know, and again, anecdotally, it's not sitting in front of me, but what I can tell you is the demand and the use of the charging stations has, you know, gone up significantly over the past couple of I'm not even gonna say years, really, it's months at this point, you know, and I, I don't want to make light of it, but there's something to be said when Tesla and there's multiple, you know, both John and Zach or Tesla guys, you know, when they rolled out the Tesla that was, you know, not knowing what 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 version you drive, but one that's more cost effective, all of a sudden it became a car that, you know, a lot more individuals had access to, which I think was important. And something that John said earlier, and I don't think we've really expanded on it in terms of the offerings in electric cars and what they are going to look like going forward is a game changer, right? So if it wasn't just, I don't want to pick on any particular car, but if, you know, if it's a small four-door sedan and that's really the only offering that there's out there, I don't know that I would necessarily be pushing as aggressively as I currently am. But seeing what is happening to the industry in terms of the offerings that the industry has, 
it, it, it is it is really impactful and I'm John watches it a lot closer I'm sure Zach does as well but what opportunities what options are out there is continuing to expand which means I think customer adoption is going to skyrocket half of it's going to be forced by jurisdiction states counties whatever it might be but then the other half of it I think is people are just going to be they want it because it's a more desirable car yeah I will just um Note that I haven't seen studies on that yet, but it's also it's just a constantly moving, quick changing industry. So even if there was a study, it would be out of date. Uh, so you know, it's it's going to be I think like like these like Keith has highlighted it. You know, intuitively it's 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 going to matter uh, if it doesn't yet, but it it will. Um, you know, we have still two to three percent EV market share of new, new auto sales in the U.S. Europe is now 10 to 20 percent, and we're not going to be that far behind them. So sooner or later, it's going to be something, you know, one out of <laughs> a lot of people are asking about and, and requesting, and it's going to matter if it doesn't today. Um, just a uh, couple of quick notes on housekeeping here. Uh, one, we're running a bit over time. We'll keep going with the Q&A. If, if everyone here is fine, John and Keith, uh, we will publish. You know, if you have to leave, that's fine. We'll, we will publish this later. Um, also, if you're... Um, leaving now or later, we have a survey in the chat. Please, uh, if you can um, complete that survey, that'd be great. There's a chance to win a $100 gift card uh, just to get feedback on this webinar. And um, yeah, so we keep rolling through the the questions. Um, question for, uh, for Keith, have you evaluated level one charging opportunities at any properties? Um, it seems much easier to meet charging demands of a growing EV driver base. Uh, some level two chargers, but more for top ups, not regular charging. Uh, you talked about this a little bit, but maybe talk a little more if you can about considering level one versus level two charging. We 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 did, but I think John talked about it, uh, you know, pretty extensively. the The challenge is that you know, not every parking spot. We, let me back up. When we develop a community, when we build one, we always park, uh, our parking ratio is always 1.8. 1, 1 so there's 1.8 parking spaces for every apartment home. We don't do it by, you know, units, one bedroom, two bedroom, et cetera. We just, we make sure that there's ample parking because there's nothing more frustrating than not having adequate parking in a community. Just kind of one of our rules of thumb. Um, Again, another competitive advantage I'm sharing with everybody, but you know we make sure that there's ample parking. So have we looked at it? Sure. If somebody wants to rent a standalone garage and put in a 110 charger level one, have at it, go for it. But from a marketing standpoint, from a competitive standpoint, we say, hey, you know, the 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 more advanced chargers are the way to go. Happens faster. And I think John alluded to it in terms of the you know the turnover, the management of these particular chargers. Um, so have we looked at it eh, a little bit? But frankly, we haven't spent much time on it whatsoever. And and if I may jump in, it's just it's just inferring. And, and Keith, you tell me uh, the same way we're talking about planning for the future now would have been the same way you would have had to put a 110 outlet next to every parking space in your garage. And I'm going to assume that's not the case. It's not there, and we weren't going to. We're not going to do it. Yeah. So I, you're you're kind of back in the same in, in kind of the same circle of your residents are going to be expecting to park somewhere in charge, and now we're going to have to park them adjacent to an outlet that maybe farther away or even indeed in somebody else's parking spot. It, 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 it's it's not a viable solution uh, if you're looking at it in the current context of what exists within a building. I used to do structured cabling and wiring back in the day. And I can tell you that that wasn't part of, of premise distribution wiring when we did it. So we never really accounted for electric vehicles 25 years ago. Uh, but there's a lot of assumptions that there's going to be an outlet nearby. And I, I don't know if that's going to hold in all cases. Uh, cool. And we have the next question is targeted at John. Uh, how many in incentive programs require software management? And how can I find out if I qualify with EV Connect? So nearly all of them require software uh, management, and that's because the utilities are investing in, in data and control of, of these assets. These are the only things that are adding net load to the grid at this point. So the utilities are looking uh, to provide the data to inform their future investment and planning, and that's why they are often requiring multi-year commitments to a managed solution. Um, how do you find out if you qualify? You, you go to the UV Connect uh, website. 
uh, we can gladly advise you by utility uh, what programs are available to you, what tax incentives are available to you, uh, and be able to map that out. That's a standard part of, of, of how we work with our clients. Thanks. Uh, next question is about cost effectiveness of networked chargers with user fees versus non-networked chargers and a rent add-on uh, for EV charging. Of course, this is assuming you don't just provide it for free, as has been talked about a bit. Um, I don't know who wants to take that, but if you want to talk about you know, the cost effectiveness of those two different approaches, I'll just repeat that for anyone listening. Um, networked chargers, so like smart chargers with user fees versus non-networked chargers, and you just add a bit on to the rent if you want to have access. Yeah, so I, I, I can take that, Keith, and then please jump in. So the once again, we just answered in the last question that managed charging is a requirement of a lot of the utility subsidies that we talked about today that help buy down the cost of, of, of your initial investment. So if you're going, let's assume that you'll bear the entire cost of the infrastructure upgrade, you'll bear the entire cost of the station, and then you're going to guesstimate how much that adds to your meter on a given month. You could do that as a rent adder. You'd also have to have all the O&M considerations and all the customer and driver support considerations. So you'd have to have an FTE assigned to that as well. When you process all of the hard and soft costs of that, I, I think that there's a good argument for having the partnership that Keith and I have had over the years because he doesn't want to concentrate on running a, a, an electric gas station in his parking lot or retailing electricity for money. He wants to have a partner that can take this, um, this obligation away and, and be able to deliver an excellent quality of service back to his customers. So I appreciate the question that um, there's, there's ways to do it cheaper. Uh, that is not what I am here to do. I'm just asking if in the overall cost of ownership, when you account for FTE hours, when you account for the cost of the electricity, and when you account for the satisfaction that you're trying to deliver to the tenant, there is an argument for having a partner in the management area. Thanks. Uh, so the next question brings up a topic that um, uh, I'll just preface a little bit. Uh, we have not talked about fast charging at all today. Uh, this, and sometimes when you see um, level two chargers on, on company websites, they, they talk about them being fast charging, uh, but they're not fast chargers. They're not what, you, what we deem in the industry as real DC fast chargers or ultra fast chargers. So the question is, aren't most of the incentives for the slow charging stations versus the fast charging? Isn't the price for one of the fast charging versions considerably more? So I'll let you answer, but I'll just, I feel like the, I feel like, um, the questioner might have thought that we were talking about fast chargers when we were talking about level two chargers that are faster than 110 volt plug outlets. Uh, so, but yeah, go ahead and, and answer that about slow versus fast. So it's, it's economic, and I'm going to assume that your read is, is right, Zach. I, I think we're probably talking about level one, which is a 110 outlet, the, the thing that you charge your phone with, the thing that you plug your computer into. That's going to add about four to five miles of range per hour of charging uninterrupted. A level two charger like we've been talking about, that is going to add roughly 25 miles of range per hour of charging. So with an eight-hour dwell time, you know, people come home from work, they park their car, they sleep overnight they're going to be able to get a full charge at their election versus on that 110 outlet, they're only going to really get about 30 miles, which is usually under people's habitual driving for the day. DC fast charging, which Zach alluded to, uh, we're not finding that as a, as a usually a practical solution at scale for a lot of our units. Number one, it's going to aggregate all of these electrical readiness questions that we've been talking about throughout this conversation. And number two, the questioner is entirely correct. Um, view that on a per port basis, that port could cost uh, anywhere between seven and 10 times more uh, to provide that extra speed. So when we look at a normal uh, resident, we already know they're gonna park overnight, they're gonna go to sleep, they're gonna plug their car in, and that gives a uh, level two kind of the optimal delivery to be able to give that resident a full charge if that's what they so choose. Thanks. And what, next question is, are there projects underway to incorporate vehicle to grid or vehicle to building systems? Yes, there are. Um, once again, that's also going to presume that you have a pretty sophisticated tie-in to renewable sources as well as storage on-prem. 
but that is a technology that EV Connect is 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 currently working on with with a bun with a couple of our clients right now. Uh, I think it's in the pretty early innings of that. Uh, from from the uh, from the current standpoint, the current adoption with both the charging station and the vehicle readiness to make that a really economic and efficient technology. Cool. And I think the the final question here, unless another big one pops in, um, have you accomplished condo projects which are in federal historic areas with state control? Uh, this is they're referencing a building of theirs, 1838 building, which was. Uh, Renovation finished in 2007. Uh, no garage, but a parking lot. So uh, it, it's a flashback uh, to uh, my old structured cabling days. I, I once wired up the Smithsonian. That was a project that I worked on. So I, I, I think I know what the questioner is talking about. The, the bottom line is you're going to see more local support uh, and, and probably a greater facilitation, uh, not only from inspectors, but also some of these other jurisdictional uh, divisions that would oversee this that are going to make it more friendly to adopt EV charging. But in those special circumstances, uh, we would have to work and maybe even value engineer the solution in such a way that it would meet all of those additional requirements, if, if I heard the question correctly. Yeah, and sorry, I, did, I skipped one. That's another fun one about uh, emerging tech. Um, are there currently plans that include inductive charging or uh, uh, wire, wireless charging, or are they mostly wired charging stations or, or entirely wired, wired charging stations that you're mm -hmm. working with? Yeah, right now, uh, wired charging is the predominant methodology um, with standardized connectors for the majority of, of U.S. cars that are available and, and the majority of the foreign cars that are available. Inductive charging gets brought up more. The vehicle uh, manufacturers um, haven't really made a call on whether to support that or not. And if, uh, if you can kind of think through a lot of the questions we have about the feasibility of installation and the rigors of installation, now we're talking about tearing up pads within a, a lot of parking lots. So it's a little more disruptive, but right now it's not a technology that is widely supported within the vehicle OEMs. All right, I think um, that basically wraps it up. I'll let you guys both, uh, if you have kind of a, uh, 30 second overview um, summary that you want to talk say say about all of this um, jump in and, and give your uh, overview elevator pitch on the, the key points of today John if you don't mind I'll, I'll jump in first uh, number one thank you very much Zach for for including me in this I, I think it was a uh, very beneficial and I certainly appreciated sharing uh, some of my thoughts you know, as a owner operator uh, of apartment communities, you know, in summary, the technology is only going to continue to advance. You know, elect the electric cars are, are not going away anytime in the future. Um, you know, this is not bleeding ed edge technology. You know, this is really, you're, you're in the middle of the pack at this point, you know, and embracing it and moving forward um, and making sure the infrastructure is in place will only end up increasing the value of your property through a number of different avenues. But bottom line, that's what we do. You know, I'm looking to increase the value of the, pro of the properties that I manage. And this is one of the pieces that, that fits into that equation. We're not in 2015 anymore, Toto, right? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I, I think Keith said it best. I mean, this is not a question of if, uh, like it was perhaps in 2015. It's a question of when. And, and when you're looking at when you're going to make an, uh, an investment that can increase the value of your property, when you're going to make an investment that's going to better serve and retain your tenants, and when you're going to make an investment that's going to make you, you know, Keith made the case for marginally more competitive uh, against like properties in the area. Um, this is an excellent time to consider that with uh, not only the technology facilitation that an EV Connect can offer uh, and the service and support that we've offered partners like Keith over the years, but also those those tailwinds that we talked about with not only the jurisdictions demanding it but now backing it up with hard dollars both the utility level the federal and the state level to be able to make this uh, kind of common sense choice as Keith laid it out to make that your building more competitive and more tenant friendly 
Thank you both. I love it. I've just, as an, as someone, like I said earlier, who's lived in these uh, communities for a few years, it's um, I'm seeing a shift underway from uh, both drivers, uh, you know, seeing a few Teslas pop into the, the community and uh, management getting more aware of it. We're probably a little ahead of, we're ahead of much of the market, but um, uh, this will be the norm everywhere, I think, before too long. So, yeah, I would get on with it soon. To all re uh, listeners and, and uh, viewers, uh, thank you for checking in. Thank you for uh, watching and uh, check in next time to get your electric fix.